Hey everybody, welcome to Third Tuesday Conversation, uh, April 19th edition. We're excited to have you uh, gathered with us. Uh, I'm Danica Olson and um, I'll be your host. Uh, today we have hanging out with us Sarah Chivari. Uh, she is a certified Daring Way facilitator and consultant. Uh, she'll tell us a little bit more what that means in a minute, but welcome Sarah. We're excited to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to um, remind people, if you either are joining us for the first time or it's been a while, uh, that we would love for you to join the conversation a little bit later in our time together. Um, so please submit your questions or comments into the box on the right-hand side of your screen. And we would also love if you would uh, join us in live tweeting using the hashtag 3TC. All right, Sarah, we are hanging out and having coffee. I would love to know a little bit about you and uh, what you do, uh, both with Daring Way, but uh, maybe something that is interesting about you or your family, whatever you'd like to tell us uh, as we get to know you today. Sure. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, I what comes to mind first, something that probably you would not find, um, you know, on my website or in any official capacity, but it was brought back to my mind last, um, beginning of last week, I was out at Rainbow Trail at the summit, um, digging into Bernie's research and leadership and faith in Christ. And as we were um, playing heads up in the evening and just having a ton of fun, it reminded me when I um, had graduated from college, one of the things I did, um, I was on staff at a Catholic mission and so mm -hmm. in West Virginia. And we always had um, high school groups and college groups come and volunteer and we were rehabbing homes. And so one of the things we would do is play bag tag, um, which is an incredibly unsanitary game, but <laughs> we would play it. And you know what you do, you've got this bag and you keep making it smaller and you have to pick it up off the floor with your mouth, not touching your hands. And at that point in my life, I was so flexible that I I always won big, tie, big peg because I could do the split on cinder block uh. with hymn books on them, and then we lean over and pick this like little scrap of paper up. Oh my! So <laughs> I think at that point that was like, let me just try to be all in in my life, and <laughs> that's 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 kind of what I see Brené Brown's research to segue into the topic, yeah. um, helping us do. Um, so I have this huge passion to unite leadership and faith in Christ and really showing up um, in authentic communities of faith with Brené's research. So I think if we were going to say, like, you know, I want to be surrounded by people who live the love chapter, and I want to be a person who lives the love chapter. You know, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, boastful. Like, we probably all, you know, raise our webinar hands for that. Yes, <laughs> like, that, that's what I would love life to look like. And as I've dwelled in Brene's research and then also Oh, we're, you're cutting out. Are you there? Well, it appears that we've lost Sarah. <laughs> She's no longer on the call. So we're going to um, twiddle our collective thumbs for a second until she connects back in. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'd love to know, um, <laughs> oh, technology, yes, thank you, gents. Um, uh, I'd love to know if you, let's make it interactive right away, how about, um, I'd love for you to tell me um, what you know about Brene's work. Have you read it? Have you seen the TED Talk? Um, what sort of um, interaction have you had with Brene's work? Tell me. I want to know. Read Daring Greatly. It's Sarah. 
Oh, good, you're back. I was twiddling. I'm, we were twiddling our collective thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm really glad to be back. Yeah, we're good to have you. Lost, okay, I lost the signal. So, what was the last thing that you heard? Um, talking. You were talking about the love chapter. And okay, how we would love so, to live that. Yeah, I think um, it's not that we don't have a heart for doing that, it's that we need some additional skills. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I think Bernie's research can really help us um, live into authentic life in Christian community and live into, you know, our calls. Um, so I think the great blessing of her research, putting it together with um, faith, is it becomes like spiritual discipline. Mm -hmm. And so there are these daily practices. So. Um, Things like permission slips and asking for what you need um, and circling back. Uh, they all are things that you don't crack the code on once. They're things that you continue to live into and practice in your life. Um, and so, Danica, I think another thing you'd ask is just kind of um, a little bit about my background in addition to my, you know, bag tag ability from yes. my early 20s. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, as I said, I'm a Lutheran pastor, and then my call to ministry is as the director of spiritual care um, at a care center with independent living. So my, and in that capacity, my primary focus is with people in the third chapter of life. Um, and in addition to that, I facilitate um, Brene's research in congregations and individually with um, church leaders and um, also work with congregations to uh, address culture using Brene's research. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. for the purpose of our conversation today, I would love if you could start with um, just sort of the high level, um, here's mm -hmm. who she is, why she's interested in this, and um, what are maybe three to five hot topics that sh come out of her research. Yeah. So, Brené Brown is a grounded theory researcher based in Texas, um, and she's done a few TED Talks which have gone viral. Um, so, my guess is there are people in your ministry context, in your congregation, who have read her stuff and would readily say, this has changed how I parent, or I thought she just tapped into my life. Um, she was speaking right to me. I, I hear that all the time. Hmm. And I think, yeah, I mean, it's true. People it really resonate with it because she's talking about how do we move from struggle to um, not orphaning those challenges, but saying, yep, that's a piece of my story, and let's integrate that. So a grounded theory researcher doesn't start with a hypothesis and then look to see you know, how it plays out. They start with people's stories. Okay. So she's collected thousands of stories. Um, interview people. You know, what does shame look like for you? Um, what is, where, where have you been courageous? And, um, you know, where was a time, when was the time you felt like you really showed up in your life? And she's interviewed people um, who are, you know, soccer moms in the suburbs to people who are experiencing homelessness to survivors of genocide, to innovative tech thinkers, to Fortune 500 CEOs. Huh. Um, and then out of that, she developed a, re a theory. And in grounded theory research, there are no outliers, which I love. You know, I love that she yeah. tells a story. And as people of faith, we are people of story. Um, those stories matter. So um, Brene isn't going to make the faith connection for us. Okay. She's coming from a from this academic, you know, rigorous model. That's the work that I'm really passionate about doing with church leaders and I'm doing it all, all the time. So just take um, like the Great Commission. If ever there was a time to kind of leave a little piece out, that might be the that might be the time. You know, um, right before these marching orders are given about what the Christian community is going to look like, there are these little words that say, and some did not believe, mm -hmm. um, which I appreciate much because it's 
the biblical narrative modeling the capacity to hold tension. And so if the biblical narrative can model that for us, we can integrate that in in our leadership. I also think it it holds a lot of authenticity. Um, that right there in that moment, there were some who were struggling in belief. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I just think there are all of these connections all across the board. So in Renee's research, she's predominantly focused on shame, on courage, specifically as it connects to vulnerability, mm -hmm. and uh, on authenticity. And then how all of these things lead to connection. So shame does not lead to connection, it leads to disconnection. So the one, two, threes about shame are we all have it. So Brene, this is like what you would hear Brene say. Mm -hmm. We all have it. The less we talk about it, the more we have it. And the reason for that is when we experience empathy, when we tell our story to someone who's earned the right to hear it, so maybe you're that person for someone in your youth ministry group or someone on your church staff, when we receive empathy, shame wilts. Shame starts mm -hmm. to die. And sh which, I mean, I just think that's hugely powerful. You know, think about... Um, Think about Jesus at the Last Supper talking about, you know, joy, having my joy in you, and that this Christian community was known for loving one another. Um, I just think, you know, those are some really fun, really fun um, connections. Yeah. And if you even take, yeah, so, so then expand that out, and then the next piece is vulnerability. Well, let me give you the definition of shame. Shame is the intensely painful belief or experience of believing I am inherently flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Mm -hmm. um, and we may know we're in shame if we feel like we can't look at someone or we want to hide or we can't imagine ever going back, you know, for another lock-in. Um, so those may be some of our tells that we're in shame. And then when you're experiencing that, how you navigate through that with more connection is to tell your story to someone who's going to give you empathy. Uh -huh. So that that connects to the vulnerability piece. Um, vulnerability, as the name defines it, is risk, uncertainty, and emotional exposure. Um, to be alive is to be vulnerable. Um, Brene says to be. Mm -hmm. That's a quote from Brene. Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, connecting it to our faith, God models vulnerability. I mean, the incarnation, yeah. vulnerable. Um, the crucifixion, vulnerable. Um, and and God relationship with us. You know, that's also vulnerable as well. And there's a paradox with vulnerability. When I see someone being vulnerable, it looks like courage to me. This comes out of research. But when I'm doing it, it feels like weakness. Uh-huh, yeah. So, yeah, yes. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're like, I don't think I can speak up in this meeting because I'm just, and then you fill in your job, <laughs> and it kind of works to keep you small, yeah. um, that's where this practice of giving yourself some permission can be really helpful. So um, those are kind of the one, two, threes about Renee's research. Great. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can help us sort of put it on the ground level. What does this look like yeah. in ministry with people in the first third of life or ministry yeah. with people who are in ministry with the first third of life? So our volunteers, yeah. uh, our kids, yeah. their parents, all those kinds of things. Do you have some insight about what this looks like with skin on? Yeah. Okay. So if you pop, okay, thanks for going to that next slide there. Yeah. So to circle back to the first slide, um, maybe you noticed there were a bunch of books by Brene and then a bunch of, you know, there was our Lutheran Study Bible and um, other theological books there, really getting to the point that there are tons of connections and we get to make those together, which is, which is really super fun. Right. Um, thinking about, well, there's two ways to answer your question, Danica, and one is just kind of nuts and bolts. There are opportunities um, for church leaders, like I referenced Rainbow Trail and the Summit, 
um, to engage in this, to do your own work, your own reflection. So yeah. um, what does this look like for me? You know, and it, and it transforms how we do ministry because we've experienced a safe, con a safe container to look at our own story. Mm. So we leave that experience, the feedback over and over is, I'm engaging in ministry with more risk, with more creativity, with more innovation, not because I left with a program for how to do that, but because I've experienced something that shifted inside of me. Yeah. So that's the first thing. There are just opportunities to engage in this work. The next thing is if you're looking for ways to potentially engage youth or your volunteers in this, um, there's the wonder, you know, the extravaganza wonder yep. uh, logo there. And I, did, I was asked to develop a resource, um, which I did, so that's available. Um, and they're conversation starters that you can use to start talking about judgment mm -hmm. and how does that pull us out of connection. Um, there's another one that talks about authenticity and connecting it with our baptisms. And then another one that talks about vulnerability and, and connecting it to, you know, the story of Jesus and Peter out on the lake and Peter getting out of the boat, but um, how Christ meets us in vulnerability. So they're just ways to start walking into it. Um, but then as I was thinking about this, just some key phrases come to mind as well. And so one of those that we use all the time in our family is, um, is the story I'm making up. Uh -huh. So you can start modeling this, and it comes from the research. You can start modeling this, um, you know, with your volunteer. You can start modeling with trust. So I will reality check, you know, um, something that's playing out in my mind. So let's say uh, my spouse comes home and he doesn't look very happy, and I make up the story. He's upset that the dirty dishes are still in the kitchen, and, <laughs> you know, I haven't done enough today. Yeah. even though I'm working from home. So rather, and if I keep going with that story, maybe I'm going to start people pleasing. Maybe I'm going to, um, you know, start picking a fight with him. I mean, I could go a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. But if I can say, okay, so the story I'm making up is that you don't think I got enough done today, um, then he can say, no, no, you know, I'm, I'm not smiling because, you know, this happened at work and I'm upset about it. Or... It does open up the conversation if it's like, yeah, I feel like I am doing more around here than I can bench right now. Yeah. Okay, then let's have that conversation. Um, and then a, a huge thing that is a piece of shame resiliency is asking for what you need. So we, we practice this all the time with our kids. What do you need? Tell me what you need. Because when we're in shame, we don't think we can ask for what we need. Um, it's... I mean, that is a hugely courageous thing to do. Yeah. So if you're working with a youth and they're in struggle, you know, you can say, so tell me what you need. How can I best help you right now? And that becomes a practice. Yeah. Often people won't know right away, and that's okay, but that's a practice you could develop in your, in your ministry context with the youth. Like, we're going to be a safe place where we can ask for what we need. And that doesn't always mean other people can provide it, but can we be with and for one another in that moment? Um, and Danica, do I have time to share one more? Yeah, Would absolutely. that be helpful, or would you like to open it up? No, let's go with one more, and then that is a great segue. Okay. If you want to join the conversation, please um, feel free to keep adding your questions um, to the question okay. box on the right side of your screen. Okay. Okay. So, so the, the last piece I would just share is um, a practice that you can develop that's like a spiritual discipline is giving yourself permission, and it comes directly out of the research, and it may feel like, wow, what am I doing here, you know? Yeah. It's, it's all about practicing self-compassion and developing a skill. So I give myself permission, you know, um, and what I have found it does is it um, stops some of those, that negative self-talk from showing up. I think it allows us to tap into what is my heart, my soul need in this. I think it um, can help us discern how the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding us. So that might look like, um, so I was out on the high ropes course last last week at Rainbow yeah. Trail. I've never done that before. I'm using permission slips, you know, because for me that feels super, super scary. 
Um, and so my permission slip for, I give myself permission to be slow. I give myself permission to be out of breath, to take time. I give myself permission to be the last one. Hmm. Um, because otherwise I would be um, open to that voice of criticism in my own head saying, you're super slow, you're out of shape, you know, um, you have no business being up here on this high rope course. <laughs> and, right? And I gave myself permission to ask for what I needed from the people around me. So, like, I'm saying to one of the other people, can you hook my, my clip on? Um, and so that's another thing we can develop in our communities of faith. Um, and then I'll just point out those two logos on the screenshot right now, Rising Strong Way, those are the two bodies of curriculum that come out of Renee's research um, cool. that, that are facilitated by trained facilitators. Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> um, you have yeah. this picture, and I'm wondering, as we get uh, questions coming in, if you could tell us about this picture. Yeah. Okay, so this picture, just on a personal note, that's our daughter's hand, um, and we love shells in our family. And then this also um, connects to one of the pieces in the conversation of wonder about authenticity, you know, exploring authenticity and real. And it's, I hope it's a provocative picture. I mean, it's a broken seashell. Um, and I think of in our baptisms, we're called into a life-giving relationship with God through Christ. And we're not called to be perfect in that relationship. We're called to be loved. Um, and the culture says we should be perfect. So this image, taking this image of baptism a shell, and letting that be the piece that's whole and life-giving, and knowing that, it, you know, in life we're going to get bruised and beaten around, um, to me is, is an image that represents the totality of what um, this ministry is about. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm going to just leave that on the screen as we answer some questions. So I'm just going to go ahead and pass uh, them along to you. First um, was a, is a statement from um, Shannon Savage Howie, who um, oversees Martin's List. Because I had asked her, is this posted on Martin's List? Um, and she said, it is a part of the Wonder curriculum that is up on Martin's List. So people can find your the stuff you made for the Wonder curriculum up. They can download it from right from there. So an answer to that. Um, okay, and this also comes from Shannon. Uh, what does the training process look like for the Daring Way? Uh, would you suggest that people get trained if they're passionate about this topic? Uh, I would say, if you're passionate about this topic, um, yeah. The, the piece of it is, is that there currently are no training schedules. Hmm. Um, Brene is working on expanding, the, uh, not expanding the community at this point, but making it deeper. Um, so I think a, a first access point could be attending um, a Daring Way or Rising Strong event. Um, just to do some of your own personal work around it and, and continue growing those connections. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth mm. uh, is her question or her statement and a question. Um, we talk so much about boundaries in the church. How does that intersect yeah. with being real and vulnerable? Ooh, I love that question. Um, I think boundaries there's, there's a whole segment on, in Rising Strong that <laughs> we walk through about boundaries. I think it's being really clear about where I end and where you begin so there can actually be a life-giving relationship. And so I can show up more authentically in that relationship. Um, and I think boundaries, the gift of them, is it can keep us out of resentment. You know, if we have expectations that are unmet, they often turn to resentment in some way. Mm -hmm. So boundaries allow us to ask for what we need and to redefine success. This is how I think about it. Redefine success. Success was that I asked for what I needed. Um, I can have a hoped for outcome, but that hope for outcome may not happen because it might be beyond my control. But I showed up in the moment of um, advocating in a healthy way, yeah. in, a, in a boundaried way. So conversation could be bigger around that for sure, but those are just some some initial thoughts that come to mind. 
Cool. Um, we had the opportunity to sit with you last Thursday, and we talked a little bit about this. The self-differentiation thing is something that um, I think is a growing edge for a lot of people, uh, especially mm -hmm. people who are in the business of caring. <laughs> um, mm. And what does it mean to be uh, self-differentiated to say, I care, but this is where my care ends, or this is where um, I, like you said, I end and you begin. Um, that's kind of messy, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I would imagine, and I haven't yeah. um, been through one of your, one of the workshops, but is that a part of the curriculum, is to help people become more self-defined? That language isn't found necessarily in the curriculum, okay. but it's, it's brought in. So I'm, I'm also trained in healthy congregations work, so systems and self-differentiation yeah. is something that I think is really important. And so the, developing these practices in a workshop gets at that. It gets at the heart of that without necessarily using that language. Okay. So think think of that permission slip piece that can help us stay self differentiated or or you know navigate through that because it is totally messy. What would you say that looks like when you're talking to a kid who's in a sticky situation with a parent or a friend? Um, how how would you use Brene's research to to help them through or to say? Um, you know, okay. even, especially with a parent, I'm thinking of you know being a teenager and trying to be self-defined with your parent, not being rude mm -hmm. or disrespectful, mm -hmm. but being mm -hmm. you know encouraging them to to really speak for themselves or speak up for what they need. Um, so yeah. there isn't the the resentment, or there also isn't the like bully factor that sometimes happens. Yeah. Yeah, I am doing this all the time with my daughter. Like, own your power. <laughs> own your power. Because I think for a lot of us, we didn't develop those skills. We weren't taught those things. Yeah. So I'll just pull an example from last night. Um, our daughter just got a new bike. And she's not a teenager. But I imagine it could play out that same way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, we're all out riding our bikes. My husband took a first spin. And I, you know, then we're going in the house. And um, I look and I'm like, Kara. Is something wrong? You know, you look upset. And she goes, no, it's okay. And I'm like, what's going on? And she said, well, I don't like it that Daddy didn't ask me to ride my bike. And we could say, you know, small thing. We could say small thing. We could say they've got so much trust in the relationship. Yes, you know, um, let it go. But I said, well, you know what? How about you talk to Daddy about that? Because I bet he'd like to hear that. Yeah. And so she said, I don't know what to say. And I said, with this, would you like some suggestions? And she's like, yeah. I said, so how would this feel? And so I said to her to say, Dad, I'm really glad you like my bike. Um, I would appreciate it in the future if you would ask me to ride it because it's really important to me. Hmm. Um, and so she, you know, she didn't, that language felt authentic to her because it acknowledged and honored my husband's relationship with the bike. And it also set a boundary. <laughs> And so, you know, she had that conversation, and it was all great. And, you know, I mean, we navigate this type of thing all the time in our family. So, you know, Tim was like, oh, that's really good. Thanks for telling me. I'll, I'll respect that in the future. Yeah. Um, so I guess in closing, you know, it's not that we ever do any of these things perfectly, but it's that we show up and we try and we do it with one another. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the goal is to have connection in a way that's authentic for me and for you. Cool. We've got several people wondering how they can yeah. find or connect with the workshops in uh, their own geographical location. Yeah. OK. So there's two resources to direct you to. Um, if you're looking for something that's integrating it directly with faith and scripture and Lutheran theology, um, that's the work that I do, and there's 
events happening. Um, there's one through Kairos, but it's currently full, and there'll be more in the fall. Um, and then there's, I'm going to different areas of the nation, so uh, if you look at the website, there's options there as well that are being hosted by local congregations. Um, you can also go to the Deering Way website, and you can, um, there's a whole list of facilitators, and so you can enter in your geographical area and find someone in that way. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I'll just mention as well, there are grant funds available through the end of 2016 um, for the ELCA. Um, so these funds can subsidize congregational events that take place, um, and they also support uh, individual church leaders when they come and they do a workshop that's connecting um, the Daring Way with faith. And so if you're curious about that, reach out to me, um, and I can get you information about that. Very cool. Your, um, your information is listed on the screen. I'm going to leave it up for 30 more seconds uh, as we sure. close our time together. Hey, this is this is great. I, um, I'm glad that I, it's such a short time, but I'm glad that we got to um, hear some of the cool things that you're working on uh, alongside Brene's work. Um, I think it's super important as we... Um, help people be healthy, uh, both mm -hmm. in ministry and with those who, with whom we do ministry with, um, to be exactly who God created us to be, which is authentic mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. showing up with each other. So I think it's just yeah. a great conversation yeah. to be a part of. So thank you so much for joining yeah. us. Um, Thanks for the invitation. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Blessings in your ministry. Your big work. Uh, this will be archived, so if you want to grab Sarah's information later, you can do that. Um, just a couple housekeeping things. The Practice Discipleship uh, includes the Wonder Curriculum uh, this, this year, and so uh, the next webinar is Thursday, May 12th, so you want to check that one out. As I said, the Third Tuesday Conversations are all archived. Uh, at elcaymnet.org slash 3TC archive. Um, you can use this conversation with maybe your teams or however you see fit. Um, and next month we're going to have Andrew Zersky. Um, he is author and a professor. Uh, he wrote the book Beyond the Screen and so we'll have a chance to uh, chat with him about that. If you haven't read it, I would highly re recommend reading that book. Um, might be awesome to, to do so before our chat next month. So looking forward to being back together May 17th uh, with Andrew and with you all. Thanks again, Sarah, for joining us. And I hope that this um, has piqued people's curiosity and that you have lots of emails flooding your inbox today. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for the chance. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Have bye -bye. a great day.